The chair of this, our fourth panel, is the Honourable John Manley, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives. And uh, as you, we, you know, well know, um, former Deputy Prime Minister, illustrious Minister of Industry, Foreign Affairs and Finance. So we're really honoured to, to have Mr. Manley that he would, would um, join us and, and chair this um, final panel. And uh, I will just, just add, we had a question uh, at the first, at the end of the first panel, uh, in the beginning of the question period, from the Tweetosphere in China, uh, from Weibo, and the first question uh, at, in the question period for this, our, our fourth panel, will be from the North American Tweetosphere, where a tweeter has sent a question. So, thank you very much. Okay, uh, well, I remember those bells. That's when you got your scissors out and ran out to the street to get them sharpened. So, that's what... <laughs> makes me think of. Um, what we're going to try to do, first of all, I'm very conscious of the fact that this has been a long day. Um, it seems like a lifetime ago that Peter Harder was up speaking to us. <laughs> it seemed like a lifetime at the time as well, for that matter. <laughs> uh, I can do that. He used to be my deputy. So, uh, yes, and, <laughs> and just to clear the air, since you were at Foreign Affairs, not with me, and, and, and I was there, and since I may not have had, the, I've had the question five times, just to waylay it from others asking, yes, I wish I had had CETA under me at the time. You probably do too. <laughs> so, no, it's the wrong decision. They should have made it earlier. Okay, so that's been dealt with. I'm, I'm hoping our, uh, every foreign affairs minister would give you the same answer, by the way. Um, I'm hoping that our panel can be really very interactive and, and uh, come back and forth. And I am conscious of the fact that it has been a long day, so we're going to try to inject some oxygen into the, into the conversation just so that we, uh, we lighten it up a bit. But you did uh, get us off to a very good start, Peter, with, a, with uh, I thought, a very good analysis of, of uh, some of the key elements. Now you've heard all the panels, you heard another keynote, you heard Ambassador Liu before you. What would you say is, for you, the big takeaway from the day's discussion? If I was uh, going to give my speech again, and I'm not, <laughs> I, I would add one thing for the Ottawa to-do list. I, I really like Ray Boisvert's comments uh, because it was an appropriate level of uh, understanding the opportunity and making uh, Canada and Canadian actors more resilient to the risks. CSIS does a, a pretty good job of preparing public servants when they go abroad to uh, have a better understanding of cyber uh, crime and protecting themselves uh, in an international uh, setting. I think the business community should be part of CSIS's clients to help those businesses who conduct uh, relations and, and, and activities uh, in, in, outside of Canada to be better aware of the risks and risk mitigation strategies that could be in place. And I think that's a contribution that uh, the Government of Canada can make to making the business community both more aware of and more resilient to uh, risk management. I think, and I think you, uh, you may be involved with a large Canadian financial institution. You've undoubtedly heard the discussion about cybersecurity yes. around. And, and, and I think the, 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 the very important point there is that, unfortunately, this comes up very often in discussion around engagement with China. And somebody sticks up their hand and says, oh, yes, but cyber attacks and what are they going to do? The truth is cybersecurity is not a Chinese exactly. uh, issue. It's, it's an issue for the modern age. It doesn't matter where, whether, whether the particular problem is emerging from within uh, Canada, within North America, or from China or elsewhere, it's something that large Canadian enterprises need to be capable of dealing with. And the government has the intelligence and the tools uh, to help with that to a degree that most private enterprises don't have. Right. Good takeaway. Okay, now, Pau, you led the economy discussion. What was the major takeaway for you from your panel? I would pick up on the comment from Professor Chang at the end of our discussion. Some of you remember when asked about the Canada-China strategic partnership, he said that uh, in a marriage, after seven years, if something isn't happening, 
uh, there's a danger in the relationship. It's <laughs> funny how both the Chinese and Western tradition have this seven-year period as the sort of the, <laughs> the danger zone, the seven-year itch, of course, you're all familiar with that expression in English. And I think that's kind of where we're at. You know, we had uh, a strategic partnership. We have one. We established it in uh, 2006. Uh, some things have happened, not as much as, uh, as I think both sides would like. There is now renewed interest, uh, certainly on the part of the Canadian government. But we have to understand that to have a strategic partnership is more than simply selling more stuff to China. It's more than just opening a few more offices or having events like this. And uh, you know, I have to thank the CIC for uh, focusing our attentions on just what a strategic partnership might be and how we get there. And what are you hoping for? What are the outcomes? Well, I, I, we, I, I think are, that would be part. What box do we tick? You know, there are a couple of things. Uh, the, the FTA as a shorthand for deeper economic uh, integration is something we have to look at. We have to respond to the Chinese overture for a free trade agreement. This overture has been made a number of times at the highest level and of course by Ambassador uh, Zhang Jinsai as well. Uh, we don't have to respond in the way that they have approached us, but we have to respond in some fashion, and it has to advance the relationship, and it has to be strategic, as opposed to simply saying, for example, that we will you know, pay more attention to exporting to China. So that's one. The second one, John, I think is on the foreign investment file. Uh, the Sinuk Nexon decision landed well, but it came out with a range of caveats, which in and of themselves are not problematic. But what is problematic is the uh, notion that's now very firmly uh, imprinted in government thinking, and I think in the public thinking as well, which is that SOEs are different and they have to be treated differently. Now, this could be quite benign. On the other hand, it could be very dangerous because when you say they are different and have to be treated differently, you can throw anything you want at them. The next time an SOE wants to make an investment in Canada, you can bring up just about any reason you want because they are in a different category. We need a conversation in this country about what it is we fear about SOEs, how it might be possible for us to mitigate those problems, as Len's session talked about, and then to come up with a very clear signal, uh, I hope positive signal, about wanting investment from Chinese enterprises, including SOEs, under uh, certain, kind of, uh, certain kinds of conditions that Canada is interested in. Professor Jai, you were observing the CNOC Nexon uh, process from, uh, from the other side of the Pacific Ocean. Was it noteworthy in China? How was the process perceived? How was the outcome perceived? And what would you expect coming going forward in terms of future Chinese investment into, uh, into Canada, either in the natural resources or other sectors? Well, I think the Chinese are encouraged. The free market principle finally prevails. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is from a good socialist. <laughs> and justice prevails. Uh, and this uh, would have an uh, encouraging effect for the Chinese investors to come to do business in Canada. But of course, uh, nothing is going to happen smoothly. Uh, politics can intervene, and uh, we are going to have a lot of problems. Uh, ahead, I, I believe, <laughs> because of this, this is the nature of politics. Uh, so we have to get embraced uh, uh, to face the problems and try to manage the problems and deal with the problems and try to make progress in, along the way. Len, there was a lot of discussion in your panel about uh, St. Ock Nexon, of course, because the investment file is still is still rather pertinent, but what, what, to summarize, what was your number one takeaway, do you think, from the panel that you moderated? Well, I think, I think the takeaway, uh, for me anyway, was, was actually a roll-up of what we discussed. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we took apart the energy sector to some extent, and we focused pretty much on oil and gas sector. And we talked about, uh, about the markets for oil and gas in the region, we talked about the infrastructure, talked about the bits and pieces, but I, I kind of came out where 
where Paul's come out, uh, in terms of, of a more strategic overview of the sector. And, uh, and that we have to look at it strategically. It's not just a matter of selling energy products or energy resources or getting investment. They're all important, but they make up a bigger, a bigger picture. And, and that bigger picture is extraordinarily promising. Now, we just need to have a, a sense of it because uh, towards the end of our, of our conversation, uh, you know, I remember we were talking about uh, Sinuk and, and Sinuk's role, and I recall Stefan actually saying, Sinuk will be a bridge. And to my, once you said that, I sort of thought that, 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 that's, that says something we haven't been saying about the investment, and that is that it will work both ways for us. And so there is an energy sector opportunity here, which is more than simply selling energy products and having investment in Canada, which has tended to dominate the, uh, the, the public discussion, certainly. It is about a, a, f a full, mutually beneficial, sectoral uh, relationship that will involve Chinese activity in Canada, Canadian activity in China, Canadian Chinese activity internationally in the sector. It will, of course, our discussion very much in oil and gas, but I think it goes to other areas as well. Gordon? The big takeaway from, uh, from your panel. Well, big takeaway, and of course, security issues are by definition negative. These are countries who are preparing war fighting it abilities to defend themselves. It was a bit themselves. of a downer, you're right. It's <laughs> inherently negative. And uh, on the other hand, I took some positive sucre from the remarks of all of the panelists, actually, that there is a wide field open there for closer collaboration. Even on the very touchy question, which Peter has spoken to, of of cyber national, be it state actors or non-state actors, a clear signal from the senior colonel that uh, China had signaled its willingness to enter into discussions on codes of conduct and how these issues might be tackled. David Manicom, in a similar vein, flagging the fact that Canada has in the past been active in a, as a non-threatening player in the Asia-Pacific region on issues related to maritime security and there can be roles in the future in that regard. Uh, so I'd say the negative, of course, is that there is increasing armed expenditures, there are risks. North Korea was highlighted, or the Korean Peninsula, to put it more neutrally. Uh, but the fact that there is a need and, in fact, pushing against an open door when it comes to a desire to uh, tackle these issues, and that Canada could provide a useful role, perhaps, as a, a catalyst in some of those, I take that as the, the positive takeaway from that negative discussion. Professor Jai, you're you're, when you look at your biography and your specialization, you know a lot about China-US relations. You've been very deeply involved in that over many years. Give us the Chinese perspective on that 49th parallel dividing Canada and the United States. Do you think that Chinese generally and the Chinese government in particular sees Canada as, as very distinct or are we kind of seen as an appendage to the United States, either in foreign policy terms, in economic terms, or in global strategic terms? Well, China is a very pluralistic country now. Uh, we have people of different views. Some people do see Canada as a sort of appendage or puppet of the US. But most people, I think, think uh, believe that uh, these are very different countries. Uh, of course, you have a lot of similarities, you share values, you have similar political systems, and you have a similar level of uh, living standard, but then uh, you are very different countries. Uh, uh, many Chinese appreciate the fact that Canada is, Canadians are very proud <laughs> that they are Canadians, not Americans. <laughs> and, and of course, they want to make a distinction between uh, Canadians and Americans. I remember we, you know, I have a, quite a few Canadian friends. Uh, they, they are very insistent that they are Canadians whenever they are introduced wrongly <laughs> as Americans <laughs> at conferences uh, uh, at different places, yes. From time to time, there are Americans that prefer to be reintroduced as Canadians as well. Just to <laughs> up. I used to know quite a few of those, actually. <laughs> But Peter, you know, you were, you were uh, Deputy Minister at, at Foreign Affairs and, and uh, however jealously we protect our independence, we always factor the United States into our decision making, into our processes from a trade point of view. They are, they are such a dominant uh, part of our, our, uh, our economy. Um, from a strategic point of view, 
you know, we tend to be very reliant on, on them for, for defense and other purposes. We're talking a lot about a new strategic partnership with China, how we move forward on that, what are some of the boxes that we can tick off in progressing in that way. How does the U.S. factor into that? What concerns uh, should we have or to what degree should we see it as an opportunity? Very good question, because I think to a lot of Canadians, uh, the relationship with the United States, certainly the economic relationship, has been uh, key to our economic well-being. Uh, geography condemns us to a whole variety of family and, uh, and uh, even vacation uh, destinations. Uh, and there is the recognition that there is a security relationship implied and explicit in, uh, in our relationship. I think the important thing for us to communicate to Canadians that it's not a zero-sum choice to think of the United States and Canada's common economic space of North America in which the Mexico-United States relationships are so economically intertwined and, uh, and, and seeing the merits of a fuller and richer engagement in Asia generally and China in, in particular. We are going to be in the unique situation of managing our number one economic relationship with the United States and our number two economic relationship with China for some time. And I think we have to have the dexterity to, uh, to uh, understand that there will be adjustments we will make to both of the aspects of this relationship to maximize it for our interest. But it's not a zero-sum game. And in fact, as many of the panelists uh, mentioned, there can be strategic advantages for the United States and for China in engaging Canada in, their, uh, in the triangular relationships. Uh, so let's get over the notion that we have to decide whether to be uh, uh, North American Canadians or be Asian Canadians. Let's be Canadians that have both a North American and an Asian personality. And we're, we're bringing that dynamic to our advantage. Gordon, do you want to get in on that? Jump in really quickly. I think the 21st century is going to be a very different space for our country. For our entire 500-year national history, we've always been, our closest partners have been countries that have had a very close cultural relationship, often a very close economic relationship with us, or similarities, France, Britain, United States. Now we're in a world where if we believe the most optimistic uh, estimates that we heard in the morning, um, the largest economy will be Chinese. The people in this room are comfortable with that and have a range of ideas how to deal with that, our public is not with us. Whether you look at the polling by the China Institute or by the Asia Pacific Foundation, there are big gaps in terms of uh, understanding or acceptance of the economic realities of the 21st century. So how it's a political challenge above all, but it is a, a societal challenge, an educational challenge, how to bring the population along, the fact that we have to work with a very different world. Australia, similar country, has done it. In my lifetime, they've gone from Europe to the United States to Japan to China now as their largest single trading partner. In that same time period, for us, it's United States, United States, United States, and United States. We're going to have to be a little more flexible and nimble. Can I pick up yes, that? jump in, Paul, yeah. and then when? Um, I totally agree with uh, Gordon that the level of public support for deeper Canada-China relations is not in place. Uh, but it's a little more complex than that because on the one hand, Canadians uh, agree that China is going to be important economically for the country. When you ask them to rank the importance of various trading partners, the U.S. of course is number one as it should be and will be for many years, but China is uh, not far behind the United States. And when you ask Canadians if they think building stronger economic ties with Asia and with China in particular is, uh, is important, Canadians will give you a very resounding yes. But then when you drill down and ask them about specific things that Canadians have to then adjust to in order to have those closer economic ties, like to accept investment from state-owned enterprises uh, in China. For example, having more teaching about Asia or Asian languages in Canadian schools, they will have nothing to do with it. You know, we have 70, 80% of Canadians who say that they don't think there should be more teaching about Asia or Asian languages in Canadian schools. So there's a contradiction. Uh, the way I would describe it is that Canadians recognize that Asia is important, China is important, that we have to look to those markets for our economic future, 
but they're not quite ready to make the really deep changes that are necessary in order to be successful. What perhaps many Canadians are thinking is that, well, we were successful for many years selling to the US and the European markets. Now that Asia is a rising market, maybe all we need to do is turn our gaze towards Asia and pretty much do what we were doing before. I don't think that's going to work. Exactly what? Uh, I'll pick up on that because uh, I think you know we, we're, we're so comfortable dealing with the United States. Yes, we have our issues and uh, and so forth, and and uh, uh, and from time to time, Canadian public. Uh, uh, tests us with respect to how fond they, they feel of a certain administration and so on. But the fact of the matter is we have an in-depth familiarity with the, United Sta with the United States. We simply have to develop the same level of familiarity with China. And I think as, as part of, of a strategy, we have to, the number two economy in the world, soon to be the number one economy, certainly our second largest trading partner, uh, we need to have that level of, of, of familiarity so that we can deal comfortably uh, with China. And we're going to be tested in this respect because not only are our economic relationships going to be compl complicated because the United States is an ec our economic base, as, as, uh, as Peter has pointed out, and we have to figure out uh, where we use the United States as a base for economic activity and where we use Canada. But in all cases, we're going to have Canadian companies involved and, 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 and making Canadians prosperous through this triangular relationship, which will be more, but also we're going to be tested in the security relationship um, as, as China and, and, uh, and the United States work out their new relationship, uh, and it'll be mainly in Asia that they will do so. Uh, we will find ourselves caught a big betwixt and betwi betwi between a little bit as to where, where we play, and we can play very positively. But again, I go back to where I started, and that is we have to know China better. Well, let me just stay with you, Len, because you used to be the Deputy Trade Minister. So we've got this complementarity study. We have overtures to do an economic partnership agreement, something like a free trade agreement that's you know, uh, coming from China. Um, we haven't responded, and as Powell rightly points out, the least we need to do is respond. Um, is this, are, are there realizable objectives for Canada out of that negotiation? Repeatedly what we heard during the Nexon CNOC discussion was reciprocity, where is the reciprocity? Could a Canadian firm buy a Chinese firm of that, of that dimension? Should, should something called reciprocity be a trade, be an objective in those negotiations? If not, why not? If so, is it achievable? Well, uh, and then Peter can get in because I can see he's <laughs> squirming. <laughs> um, I, I don't think, in, in a pure sense, oh. reciprocity is, uh, should be part of it and can be part of it. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the example you use simply is not a realizable one. But what this economic agreement can do, and I certainly believe we, we need, um, Peter, with Peter on this one, we, sh we should be moving ahead. We're, the Chinese aren't going to wait forever for, the, for them to, for us to pick up the invitation. Um, and it's in our interest to get that, to get that negotiation underway, as difficult and as long as it might be and as complex as it's going to be. But in the course of the results of that, of getting the results of that, we put ourselves in a better position so that, so that when we do get ch investment from, from China, uh, we will have a, a, an intergovernmental environment and a habit of behavior which will, will ensure that our companies have the same kinds of opportunities there. That's the way you level the playing field. It's not sort of saying, well, we'll allow a Chinese company to invest in the oil sands if we can get a permission for a Canadian company to invest in a certain area. So I'm not in favor of reciprocity one for one, but I think this agreement will set the stage for an environment in the relationship which will make those sorts of, 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 of bargains unnecessary. Peter? Uh, Len is speaking good sense on this. Not surprisingly, as a former deputy of trade and at foreign affairs, uh, Canadians sometimes have a rather uh, virtuous view of our own behavior. Uh, we've had restrictions in a number of sectors, cultural, uh, uranium. We still restrict log exports uh, in Canada so that uh, competitors are better equipped to uh, enter the Chinese market or the J Japanese market or the Korean market because they can enter into long-term contracts, but no, we have, we have log restrictions. Uh, so we pretend we're free marketers 
Uh, and if only everybody else was as good a Boy Scout as we say we are, the world would be a better place. I think the good thing about trade negotiations is they actually respond to the self-interests, the mutual self-interests that you're prepared to put on the table. And uh, at the end of the day, you usually come out with a win-win situation, and that is in our interest. Reciprocity is a mug's game of emotion. By the way, you, you, you would never suggest that that moral high ground superiority attitude is a uniquely Canadian characteristic. No, but we have perfected it. Uh, <laughs> now, now. Others are pretty good at it too. Who was that other big country that's close to us? But, uh, Powell? That's one of our exports. <laughs> <laughs> free trade agreement or closer economic arrangements with China, uh, we should of course be thinking about the Chinese economy that is to come rather than the Chinese economy we have now. And that's particularly so because we know how rapidly the Chinese economy is changing. And that's why you may recall those of you who were here in the morning, were, I asked a question to Professor Huang Yukong to give us a picture of what the Chinese economy might look like 10 years from now. And if he is right, it is an economy that will be more driven by services, by consumer spending, by, he didn't use this term, but I will use it, quality of life spending. And in order for China to get there, I believe very strongly, and he does, I think, as well, there will have to be some liberalization and opening up of those markets in China. Now, those are precisely the areas that are the sweet spot for Canadian competitiveness. We are good at those things. The irony is that the early phase of Chinese economic development through the reform period, the opening up till more or less till today, has been in the area of low-cost manufacturing exports, as you all know. That actually isn't our sweet spot. We don't have that much of a manufacturing sector. I know we've got auto parts and so on, but we haven't participated essentially in that phase of China's rapid economic expansion. What I'm trying to say is that this is our time. If there's a time for us to really thrive in China, this is our time. And the way in which we can get uh, a leg up in China in the very areas where we are strong is by negotiating preferential arrangement. So if we believe the China of the future, the next decade, is going to be like this in services, consumer goods, healthcare, education, quality of life stuff, we know we have that kind of expertise. Why are we not trying to negotiate preferential access to the market. Well, I'll tell you, the one, the most common uh, reason that has been cited as to why we shouldn't do a free trade agreement is that it's hard. I've heard this from, you know, very senior people across the board. It's too hard. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when your child wants to do, when you want your child to do something that's good for your child and your child says, it's too hard, do you say you don't do it? I mean, that's not the way we do things. Just because it's hard doesn't mean we don't pursue it. And I think we have to get beyond simply worrying about how difficult it is to figuring out if it's good for us and if we are persuaded that it's good for us to really go for it with gusto. Now, Professor Jha, is China willing to do some hard things in negotiating with, China, with Canada in order to make this a reality? Well, we have been doing the hard thing all the time. <laughs> uh, we don't have a choice, uh, but Canada may have a choice. So maybe you can relax and enjoy yourself. <laughs> but, but I think in the long run, if you believe in competitiveness, if you believe competitiveness uh, would lead to a better life, then probably you have to make some hard choices. right? Oh, that's a tough premise for a trade negotiation when <laughs> usually people like to be protected and other people should compete. But um, <coughs> as we go forward, um, is this, I, I guess the next question is, do we have within our public institutions, uh, which is partly Ottawa, partly the federal government, uh, but increasingly in these negotiations, provincial governments, um, within our, uh, our uh, social fabric, our institutions, do we have a broad enough level of understanding of the importance of uh, opening trade for 
uh, for Canada. Is that is that there? You've done polling on this, Paul. What do you think? Can we can we win that? We've we've asked the question. Uh, in fact, we have a range of countries that we ask Canadians to rank in uh, in terms of importance for free trade agreements. I think the China figure is in the low teens. That that is to say, uh, uh, you know, between ten and fifteen percent of Canadians would support. Uh, a free trade agreement with China. And that's, of course, exactly why we haven't responded to the Chinese over trade. It's exactly why it's hard to generate political leadership from any party for something like this. And that's why there's a very big role for organizations like the CCBC and the China Institute and the CIC here today, my own organization, to try to get Canadians to talk about why China is vital to the economic future, to dispel some of the fears that Canadians have about China, so that we can, this will take time, but so that we can prepare the public to provide the political uh, ballast for our political leadership to then go forward with an agreement. Can I, can I get yes, in on this? Uh, you know, if you look at the experience that we had to come to terms with even the common economic space of North America, it took the McDonald Commission to do the studies uh, to be a neutral third fora in which uh, uh, the arguments could be made as to why uh, a free trade agreement with the Americans was in our interests. Uh, if it's not a new McDonald Commission, I do think there has to be some uh, high level convening of conversation uh, which will allow the broader stakeholders of Canadian society to participate in the understanding that is necessary as a precondition of entering this kind of uh, economic altering relationship. Uh, and maybe that's something we should be giving some thought to. I don't think there would be an appetite to do a royal commission or anything, uh, but it's, it's got to be a broader conversation uh, than the details around preparing for a trade negotiation. Uh, and that's one where I, I think uh, uh, the, the organizations and stakeholders represented in this room uh, can collectively contribute. I think that, that, that's absolutely true. I was going to say that one of the problems around trade negotiations is that people don't understand them. Uh, and, and that's partly the fault of government over time. We haven't, we haven't since really since the free trade agreement with the United States, did we engage Canadians in a, in a broad discussion. And so, uh, we have a whole other generation who, some of them who have grown up at the knee, sitting at the knee of individuals who say that free trade's bad. So uh, there's a lot of mythology out there around trade, first point. The second is, is uh, when it really comes to, to the areas that, uh, as you know, uh, John, uh, we, we only have a few really protected areas. Mind you, they're politically very sensitive ones. Um, but, you know, there's no reason in this world why we have, we maintain tariffs on on a whole range of products. In fact, we would probably be better off with a tariff-free country, um, uh, setting and, aside. And by the way, very little notice of the fact that yesterday tariffs were raised I on all goods coming in from China, Korea, uh, and Brazil. Yeah, we should have done the opposite. But uh, the fact is that uh, that you get that out there. Did anyone <laughs> read that? And <laughs> but the fact is that that um, that the tariff. Uh, is, a, is an obsolete instrument, and, and even as a, as a, as a revenue earner, it, it's, it's, it's not substantial enough to be worth keeping. So, um, but the thing is that we're now moving into these fine areas of intellectual property, government procurement, co uh, competition policy, and that's all gobbledygook to most people. And so, um, I, I'm entirely where, where Peter is on this. We need to do some education with the Canadians so they understand the benefits that, a, that a, a broad agreement like this is going to pursue. Not only a broad agreement with China, which will be an altering event, but, a, but uh, trade agreements generally. Jump in, Gordon. I, I shall jump in again. I think we need to play a long game here. I mean, for one thing, we could all decide today we're going to negotiate an FDA with China. Australia is a decade in, and their senior officials are saying, don't hold your breath. It's going to be a long time yet. I totally agree with Peter. We do need a national, or at least, at least attempt to have a national consensus at the, at the highest level, or how we're going to move forward vis-a-vis -vis China. But we also need to have, maybe it's because I'm at a university, we need to have a ground game and a long game. Um, we need tens of thousands of young Canadians, not just a couple thousand, who are more knowledgeable of China, who have visited from my experience in government, I didn't know of a single minister who had been to China, 
for the first time who did not come back with a more nuanced view of the place. It's very hard to sustain. I shouldn't pick on ministers, actually, but generally, uh, Canadians Everybody in general. Everybody else does. Why not? <laughs> Just thinking of my chair here. Uh, it's hard to come back, having been exposed to the complexity of modern China, and have simplistic or stereotypical views. And that needs to be done in the curriculum. It needs to be done in, in the schools and the universities. It takes time. It will only take a couple decades. But we're a country with a, long, with a long future. We need to play that long game in the 21st century and not just have, we must have that high-level strategy. We need the ground game to go with it. Yeah. While we do the long game, there is a shorter game that I think we can really work on, and that is the whole issue of um, uh, non-partisan or multi-partisan support for the importance of China and the Canada relationship. One of the <laughs> challenges we've had in, in the recent five, six years, of course, was the fact that the China relationship became politicized. And this is the nature of democratic politics. We should not be surprised about it. There is a risk, I think, that uh, it can be politicized again. Uh, in Australia, for example, you have a pretty much a all-party consensus on the importance of China for that country. And so while the uh, Australian politics is brutal, I mean, they take no prisoners. But when it comes to uh, James Slava, you know very well how awful, I mean, we know that right now in the Labour Party, of course, it's going on as we speak. But on Asia policy, on China policy, the Liberals and the Labour and, and all the coalition partners basically agree that this is something Australia has to do. So I think there are some things we can work on now because there is, you know, the Liberal Party is going through a transition. The NDP hasn't quite fully come out on how, what it thinks on some of these issues. Uh, it is, you know, very suspicious of trade deals, of course, but there's an opportunity to, to clarify some of that thinking. And if those of us in civil society can help develop a kind of all-party consensus on the fundamentals of why China is important for this country, John is smiling at me because he knows I'm being totally naive about this. Uh, some of, some <laughs> of our political actors haven't agreed on whether the United States is important to our future, so that could be a tough one. <laughs> so I should change. This is not a short game, this is a long game. That's a long game, yeah. <laughs> Professor John? Yeah, I guess Americans uh, have a, uh, what the U.S. does has uh, some impact here. <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> President Obama announced a program uh, called 100,000 Strong. Uh, that is to send 100,000 American students to China as a way to promote understanding uh, between the two countries. Uh, of course, China has already sent something like 200,000 students to the US. Uh, Canada may not go as far. Uh, I would suggest maybe you come up with a program like 10,000 strong, <laughs> then we can have more and better understanding between the two countries. Well, I, I actually, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the inflow from China is now about 25,000. No more, about 60,000. 60, 60, 60, 60, oh, okay. So generally, when we look at you, compare Canada to US, we look at it as 10 to 1, because their population is about 10 to 1. So actually, we're doing quite well. Going the other way is not so, is, is not so, is not so promising. Mm. But I think education is actually our number one export to China at the present time, from Canada. So just a factoid that may or may not. Now, be, we're going to move to the floor for questions. And Matthew, uh, wherever he is, has collected a question from the uh, Twitter sphere. So uh, where is, are, is, you're at the microphone, and then please line up, and we'll go to the floor. Matthew? My name is Matthew Quickrib. I've been doing the Twitter account for the Canada International Council today. Uh, and we've been putting out, like you said, the call uh, for questions uh, to the Twitter sphere. And that has been retweeted by various uh, groups, actually, across the country. So this question uh, represents uh, a question from the cyberspace of North America. And it comes from Nip Har Nick Harper, who asks, what potential is there for Canada to participate in Chinese-based global value chains? What do we need to do to deepen involvement? And is a free trade agreement the best option? That's the Prime Minister's pseudonym, by the way, on Twitter. Uh, 
Professor Jaw, I'm going to let you start that, and then Peter referred to it in his speech, so I'll go to him, and then, and then anyone else that wants to pile on. Well, uh, I think whether Canadians want to join FTA uh, negotiation with China is uh, their decision. Uh, again, uh, I don't see the urgency on the part of the Canadians to to participate in this kind of negotiation because, I mean, you have so many resources. Why do you want to increase your competitiveness? <laughs> you can sell the resources and enjoy yourself. But, but of course, I I'm just... I thought you were a specialist in the I'm United kidding. States. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, personally, I believe that you should participate in the negotiation. Uh, with uh, China on the FDA. Uh, if you don't do it, we may have it with Australia or other countries. Uh, you are going to be left behind. So uh, I think it's in China's interest, it's in Can Canada's interest uh, for us to uh, enter into nego uh, FDA negotiation. And also, this is also in the best interest of, of the international society as a whole. Uh, if China and Canada can work out some kind of a FTA uh, deal, this would help encourage the two countries to, to be more open to the outside world. This is good news. Peter, supply chains? Certainly, uh, supply chains or, uh, or global value chains, or call them what you will, uh, are the only opportunity for the Canadian manufacturing sector to survive. Uh, it's to uh, knit our sector's expertise and advantages, particularly in areas involving technology, into global supply chains. Uh, and I see the opportunities for us to do that through uh, existing Canadian players that are global as they enter the Asia generally, and China in particular, and I gave the example of Bombardier, or Canadian supply chains, uh, or, or uh, uh, parts of the Canadian uh, manufacturing sector uh, that are going to Asia uh, from a base of, uh, of some strength and are acquiring and building greenfield assets that plug into uh, the manufacturing that's, uh, uh, explosion taking place in Asia. The, the third way, of course, is for our SMEs uh, who are not yet part of global supply chains uh, to find the opportunities uh, in the global market. Uh, and that is uh, through strategic alliances, through the efforts the SMEs are making to have an Asia strategy. Uh, and and that's, that's good. The final way is to uh, use the bridge that uh, Mr. Fang uh, offered of the scenic like transactions, which uh, give the opportunity for Canadian suppliers who were supplying to Nexon to now, uh, through their uh, privileged relationship with now Sinook, uh, introduce themselves to the Sinook family and through that to the broader set of, of uh, very global players in China. So it has to be a very deliberate and active a company specific strategy that says, how can I bring uh, what I have and leverage that into a broader relationship? The advantage of an FTA is that over the longer term, it gives you access to the supply chains of broader than manufacturing sectors. It's the service sector, and it's the opportunities that that can have. So they're not exclu mutually exclusive, but I suspect we can make more progress quickly on the manufacturing side of supply chain uh, uh, strategy, uh, but we should not uh, uh, sort of avoid the opportunities that uh, an FTA negotiation can achieve. Paul, jump in. To add to what Peter said, uh, I think one area where we can add tremendously to Chinese supply chains is precisely in the service sector. There's some new research that's out by the OECD that measures trade by what they call value added. And what that data set shows us is that the contribution of services to value added in international trade is much larger than many of us imagine because mostly services are hard to, hard to measure, they're embedded in goods. And this is where many of our companies, including the companies Peter talked about in his speech, are already adding value to Chinese exports in ways that 
we hadn't thought about before. CSA, what CSA is doing in China, is adding huge value to Chinese exports because it's making them marketable in the global market in the first place. That is a supply chain addition. And we have companies that do uh, a variety of uh, activities in the services sector that add value similarly, whether it's quality control or the environmental processes or the manufacturing processes, all the software that's involved, uh, uh, engineering, architectural services that go into manufacturing. These are the huge areas where we can, we can help uh, add value. And of course, these are the areas that are the most protected. And so I get back to my point again. In the very sectors where we have a lot to benefit, where we can contribute to Chinese manufacturing value added, those sectors are closed off generally in China. A free trade agreement can help us open up those sectors. Okay, okay Len? Yeah, just one Quick. final point, which I think partly runs out the picture, and that is that within Asia itself, the trade is increasing interregionally. Uh, so uh, Canadian companies who want to be part of those global value chains will increasingly have to be in Asia. They'll have to be in China. And, uh, or we could use a, uh, an American platform. We talked about the triangularization a little bit earlier on. But it simply means that we, that we have to get out of Canada and, and be in those areas. That's why, that's why the longer term agreement is really important, right of establishment, ability to set up shop in these places to manufacture, to, to provide services, architectural design, and those sorts of things that are needed right now. So uh, it all drives us to Asia, and it all drives us to China. So thanks to Nick Harper, whoever he is, for that. So over to this microphone, who have we got here? Good afternoon, xiao uh, My name is Nerissa. I'm a first year law student at the University of Ottawa. Uh, I have one quick comment and one question. So uh, the quick comment is on what Professor Zhao uh, mentioned earlier about the 10,000 uh, program. Uh, in <laughs> 100,000. So uh, just to make you feel more encouraged, my, uh, my colleague Elena and I, we are putting together a China-Canada um, Law Society for students just to create this, uh, be this liaison and to uh, um, bring awareness and, and to make students want to know more about China. And I might be knocking on, a, on your door to get you to be the speaker <laughs> <laughs> for future events. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, so my question for uh, the panelists, and then later for Professor Jia particularly, is on the uh, um, China-Canada Foreign Investment Protection and, and the Promotion Agreement that Canada signed last year. Now I know that um, after Prime Minister Harper signed that agreement, it attracted a lot of scrutiny within Canada. So two of the biggest concerns are, one is the, um, the enforceability of the uh, arbitration clause against SE, uh, SOEs, and the second one is the, um, um, the equal, unequal access to markets. So I want to know what you think of those two concerns. Are they rational? And also for Professor Jia, uh, what is the Chinese perspective on the, the, the agreement? Thank you. Pipa? Who wants to? jump in on that. Uh, I didn't quite catch the second point you made. Uh, with respect to, to dispute settlement, um, uh, you know, yeah, the Australians uh, don't accept this notion of, of a third party dispute settlement. Uh, but I think it's a rather small group of individuals in Australia that do. Every, any trade official I've ever talked to in Australia would like to see a third party uh, dispute settlement, all by way of saying that it is an accepted international practice now. It's, it provides arbitration in a purely objective environment and, uh, and it, it permits uh, decisions to be taken outside. It, it's, not a, it's not a threat to our sovereignty, uh, nor should it be to Chinese sovereignty. It is simply the most efficient and effective way to have a balanced outcome. Yes, go ahead. Just jump in here quickly. I mean, as one of the hundreds of people who worked on that over the course of the last couple of decades, um, we had consistent pressure from the Canadian business community. Can we not have something that puts us at a, in a better position vis-a-vis -vis protection of our assets? Um, Chinese legal system has come a long way, but faced with possibility of an offshore arbitration or to go to court with a Chinese company, I'd take the former before the latter, and so would most Canadian business. That was a direct right. response of governments, plural, to de demand for the business community. I think that's right. That was my point. Sorry. Professor Jha? Uh, I think the agreement is a good one. Uh, 
uh, with regard to uh, we need protection of our investment. Uh, Canadians are concerned about their investment in China, and Chinese are very concerned about their investment in, the, in, in Canada too. Okay? So we have to uh, do something reciprocal at that level. But in terms of total, complete reciprocity, I think that's uh, unrealizable. Uh, why? Because China's market is so big, I mean, it's much larger than that of Canada. How can we achieve complete reciprocity? Okay. Um, basically, Canada, if we, if we have an FTA, if we have a uh, you know, reciprocal, so-called so reciprocal uh, uh, protection, Canada benefits more than China does in terms of the size of the market. Total reciprocity is not possible, but then uh, relative reciprocity is, uh, is realizable. Over to this microphone. Hi, Travis Jern with the Canada-China Business Council. Uh, coming from Quebec, a topic that often comes up uh, regarding the free trade agreements is the work that Pierre Marc Johnson is doing on a free trade agreement with Europe. Uh, it had been mentioned at an event recently in Montreal that there's a potential impact on the relation with China through the aspect if the free, to treatment, uh, free trade agreement is realized and the very real possibility in the future that the euro still exists. Uh, that it could make Canada a position where it's a part of one of the largest economic ecosystems in the world between both North America and links through Europe. That might bring considerations to what kind of strategic relationships Canada could have with China. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Who wants to jump into that one? Len, go for it. Well, the, uh, uh, I think ev everyone, uh, Peter covered this you know, in, his, in his comments this morning, and I think he hit every nail right, right on the head. I would just say that, that um, uh, obviously we do a deal with, with Europe, and it has, it's good and it has value. Um, it, it allows us to use the European route into the Asian market into China as well. So if that's the point that Pierre Marc was making, I, I think that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, one, one reason for getting the CETA done, of course, right now is so we can turn our attention, frankly, to Asia and to China. Right. We, we need to free up the resources and our public attention and so forth to the next step. So the sooner we get that one done, the better. And, and another reason to do the CETA is to demonstrate that Canada can actually conclude. Complete. <laughs> Credibility. Well, that's Credibility. It, it's an important point, considering that we started with Korea before the United States did. <laughs> And, and the theory was that we would get it done and be the template. Yes. And, and uh, on CETA, the Americans have just announced that they're going to start in June. That's right. Uh, we better conclude. <laughs> and uh, frankly, one of, the, one of the reasons that I would argue that we should begin this road with China yeah. is at some point the United States That's will. Right. That's right. And then where will we be? And by the way, the European negotiators, I was told last week in Europe, have now moved on to Japan. Mm -hmm. So it's at the political level, and they either do a deal or they don't do a deal. So it's... The it's are moving on to Europe. We're also negotiating with Japan, of course. Yes. <laughs> so, well, that's cheery. Uh, over there. Hi, uh, my name is Fred. I'm a first year master's student at the Norman Patterson School. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about international education. Uh, and I would just like to say that I think Canada has a very unique uh, advantage in that we have one of the most multicultural populations in the world, um, especially when it comes to our Canadian Chinese uh, population. I just want to uh, hear your opinion on uh, if we're ledger leveraging this uh, advantage well. If not, what, uh, what can we do to make it better? What, what do you think about that, Powell? I mean, we hear about that a lot, and we hear about, you know, in political circles, we're always talking about yeah. how we use the diaspora, whether it's Indo-Canadians or Chinese Canadians or sometimes uh, other groups. I, I, we have a large Asian Canadian population, and it's one of the fastest uh, subgroups in this country. As you know, I'm from Vancouver, and Vancouver is an Asian city today. It's the most Asian city outside of Asia. By 2020, it will be a majority Asian population. And I agree with you totally that the population in general is underutilized in some sense in terms of building stronger trade ties and so on. 
But I think our politicians generally overstate the way in which our Asian Canadian population can be a tool or an advantage in our foreign policy and trade policy. There's a book that's just come out, by the way, by uh, John Ibbotson and Daryl Bricker. Bricker. Bricker, yeah, called The Big Shift. And the thesis there is that um, because the Conservatives were able to win a majority in the last election that brought together an alliance of uh, rural Ontario uh, voters with suburban Ontario and uh, suburban BC voters, they have now brought the Asian Canadian population into the Conservative fold and the Asian population will drive Canada to be more of a Pacific nation. I, mean, I think that's very simplistic. Uh, there are some hard things that have to be done to make Canada more successful in the region. They have to do with some old-fashioned trade policy and diplomacy and political engagement and education of the mainstream public. So I, I'm, of course, a very big fan of trying to get the Asian Canadian community more engaged and better utilized in the Canada-Asia relationship. But the reality is that, you know, most of the political class still tends to see this population, really they see them as vote banks rather than as real assets in the relationship. And until that changes, until people like you and me and others in this room are seen as diverse individuals with diverse views about the world and politics and economics and so on, uh, it will be very hard to mobilize the community as any kind of a unified force and build a stronger relationship with Asia. Vote banks. You I never was always it. looking for a vote bank. I never <laughs> found it. If I could have put them on deposit and saved the extra ones for the next election. Any other comments on that? Totally agree. Um, over here. Hi, my name is Jean-François Vanier. I'm with the Finance Department. I have a question about the... Uh, we've and they let you of, out today? Uh, yes, indeed. Well, we, oh. we released our, 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 our B word yesterday, so uh, we're, we're allowed to come out. You caught tonight. the thing about raising tariffs in yes, uh, indeed. China. But, I mean, in, in, our, in, in the government's defense, we can talk about the unilateral tariff relief that has been implemented since 2009, so it's possible uh, yeah, to right. balance that, just, just to be fair. <laughs> um, but I have a question about, we've Good talked a lot about the free trade agreement today, and there would unquestionably be large benefits if all the wonderful scenarios that you paint in terms of access to services, access to investment, think, let's, let's be really ambitious and think about government procurement, all that could actually come to pass. But all that is contingent on negotiating a successful agreement. Australia is very close to China and they've been going at it for eight years in what one Australian official described as a long drawn out soul destroying process. So what gives you the confidence to assert that an FTA is necessarily in Canada's interest? A small country like us, Professor Jha just mentioned that we could never hope for balanced reciprocity because Canada would benefit too much because China is a larger market than we are. So given our small clout and the fact that an FTA that would actually achieve what you've described would be groundbreaking for China, why do you think that's possible? Well, the Kiwis feel differently about it. We, uh, Tim Grosser was at your event, John, yeah. uh, a few months ago, and he first of all, was very unambiguous about the benefits of their free trade agreement. They're the only country, by the way, the only OECD country that, uh, only Western OECD country that has a free trade agreement with China. They were able to conclude very rapidly. It's unambiguously good for New Zealand, according to, to Tim Grosser. And it was done relatively expeditiously. Now, they, as far as I can tell, it's a comprehensive agreement. I think they left out some investment provisions, but otherwise it was fairly comprehensive. They obviously calibrated their expectations and they were able to succeed with their calibrated expectations. We have to do the same. You know, when we went into negotiations with the Koreans, uh, we wanted to close very rapidly before the Americans got in. Americans got in after we did, and then they closed before we did. And we said to the Koreans that we want everything the Americans got from their agreement. And the Koreans said, well, you're not the Americans. We're not <laughs> going to give it to you. So we can take two positions. We can say, no, we are like the Americans, and you give us everything you gave the Americans, or we can calibrate our expectations. Well, I mean, you decide. What do you want? Not have a deal? Or have a deal that's slightly less than perfect? I think we have to take the same attitude towards China. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And one thing is absolutely certain, if we don't do anything, we won't get anywhere. That's right. Uh, so uh, I do think that it's a long journey, but the first step is the necessary one. And uh, we need to uh, uh, pursue it vigorously. And I believe there's every aspect of goodwill on both sides 
uh, to accomplish a meaningful conclusion uh, to an agreement uh, in, that would be a win-win. There's, there's too much opportunity for both sides. Professor Jai, you want to uh, comment on that? Well, I think they are sure. perfectly, their remarks are perfectly <laughs> sensible. <laughs> I, I'm in total agreement with them. <laughs> I, I actually learned something from that question, as I always do from officials at finance, which is that trade negotiators have a soul. So, uh, uh, over here. Hello, my name is uh, Gary Levy. I have a question about political developments rather than trade developments, and I know this very knowledgeable panel can provide some insights. The, the new administration in China recognizes the need for political reform. The previous administration also spoke about the need for political reform, and in fact, over a decade, there were many reforms in China. My question is, what should we understand by this term when they speak about political reform? And uh, what can we expect, reasonably expect, over the next decade uh, in terms of political reform? That's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I know I can't avoid it. <laughs> um, political reform. Uh, you can say that. Well, I think. Uh, Chinese understanding of political reform uh, so far uh, probably can be characterized into a few things. One is um, uh, rule of law, uh, strengthening rule of law. The second is uh, to make the public officials more accountable. Okay. Uh, and uh, also uh, division of power uh, creates some kind of checks and balances within the administration. Uh, not, not, not the checks and balances like in the US you know, between the legislative branch and the executive branch and the judicial branch, but within the administration. Okay? Uh, in other words, within government so, so, so that they don't abuse power. Uh, China has done a lot uh, in these areas uh, in the past. Uh, in 30 years ago, China did not have much of a law. You know? Now we have a legal system, and we have lawyers, we have judges, <laughs> even though they are not as good as uh, we hope. Okay? And uh, 30 years ago, it was a situation in which uh, this, the leaders were appointed uh, at the discretion of the of the existing leaders. Okay. Now, if you are to serve at a certain kind of positions, you have to go through a you know, very sophisticated and complicated process of selection. Okay. They may not work as, effect, uh, as we expect, uh, but then uh, they are much better than they used to be. Um, and, and of course, uh, Division, uh, I mean, uh, checks and balance uh, mechanism within the administration. I think that's been uh, also uh, put in. You know, you have people in charge of super supervision. You have people who uh, who do the accounting, and now you have to do your budget. In the old days, you you did not even have a budget. You know, you spend the money as you want. Okay. Now you have to do a budget, and then uh, your budget is going, I mean, you have the accounting office to go through the budget. So it uh, makes uh, uh, pocket, m pocketing uh, money into your own bank account more difficult. Uh, how will this government different from the previous government? Uh, uh, I think this government is going to do more. Uh, I mean, this new leadership. Uh, uh, I think the character of the leadership uh, is different. Okay. The last, uh, I mean, leadership uh, did not do, uh, try to do something until after the NPC, National People's Congress, uh, and the CPPCC uh, were held. Uh, uh, so, you know, during the NPC meeting, they, they elect the president, the, the premier, and, and the ministers. 
uh, this batch of leadership is very different. You know, they started right after the Party Congress. Okay. They began to do a few things, uh, and 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 have been very uh, successful and popular. Okay. Among other things, you know, they try to simplify the ceremonial. Uh, and protocols and procedures, and then they banned, uh, you know, uh, drinking, uh, drinking and whining, uh, excessive drinking and whining. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and also, you know, I remember uh, at the 30th anniversary of the founding uh, of the 82 Constitution or current Constitution, uh, President or Secretary General Xi, uh, Xi at the time, you know, he gave a 30-minute speech. Uh, it was incredible, you know, the best speech I've ever heard uh, from a Chinese leader f for a long time. Okay, uh, he was direct. His his logic was very clear. Uh, he tried to clarify the relationship uh, between the leadership of the party, the fundamental interests of the people, and the constitution and rule of law uh, and laws. He said the party leads the con people to make the constitution according to their interests. Uh, the party uh, has the responsibility of enforcing the constitution and the laws. And then the party should take the lead to, imp to observe the constitution and the laws. This is uh, the first time the Chinese leadership publicly uh, clarified the relationship between these three important components of the rule of law in China. So if this is uh, put down into practice, it's going to be very interesting. Okay? China is going to make big stripes uh, in, in, in the direction of rule of law. So, and there are other things the, the, the new government has, the new leadership has done. So that cr has created a lot of expectation in China. I'm more hopeful. Than ever, than I've ever been. So uh, maybe I'm going to be disappointed, but then uh, I uh, I hope not. <laughs> so maybe five years or ten years later, uh, you can ask the same question whether you are disappointed or not. <laughs> but at the moment, I'm very hopeful. Thank you. Well, was a very fulsome answer. I want to I want to assure you, Professor Zhao, that. Nobody in this country has ever been disappointed by the performance of their government. Uh, <laughs> last question. Thanks, John. I'm Paul Davidson. I'm president of the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada. First, thanks for animating a great session and to CIC for a very comprehensive day. I want to pick up on a comment that John made on the song, which is that international students from China represent the largest source of income for Canada from China presently. It's an often overlooked fact. More generally, international students contribute $8 billion to Canada's economy annually. Bigger than the export of wheat. Bigger than the exports of Bombardier. And that the benefits are felt right across the country. If I may, I'll just give a small anecdote. At the Vancouver Island University in Nanaimo, there are 600 international students living with host families. That has replaced the income of three mills that have shut down. Those students' parents are now visiting Nanaimo and investing in Nanaimo. Those visitors are seeing that there is protein in the oceans. And if they want to exploit that resource, they're going to have to work with Canada's First Nations people. So they are investing in First Nations talent <coughs> so that they can work collaboratively to exploit the resource for the world's benefit. It's just a small example of how the education sector contributes to a strategic relationship with China. I want to commend Pao for his work on talking about the broader cultural engagement between uh, China and Canada. And the, the question that I would like to put uh, to, the, to the panel today is twofold. <coughs> there were some modest steps in yesterday's budget to promote international education. We're on the path. We've started that process. But what would the role of Canada's private sector be in accelerating that path? And the second question I would put is in talking about foreign investment uh, reviews, what would the potential be for encouraging Chinese investors 
to support uh, Canadian students studying in China as a net benefit to Canada? I'll pick up on the first one. Um, it's really exciting that the government is putting some support behind sending Canadian students abroad. And it doesn't have to be China. It can be other markets as well. But the risk, you know, is that these students come back and they can't find jobs. And we've actually seen this problem with a number of uh, Asia-focused programs in the 80s and 90s, where very enthusiastic young people spent years learning Japanese and so on, spending time working abroad. And when they came back, they found that their Asian experience wasn't valued by Canadian companies. So there's a structural problem in this country that we have to work on. We absolutely have to send more of our young people abroad to get knowledge and language and experience. But we also have to educate our private sector here to value international experience. You know, there's something very telling in this new immigration class that we've created called the Canadian Experience Class. Some of you are familiar with it. It's a, a category which allows um, students, foreign students in Canada to basically uh, work for another two years, I think it is, and then apply for land and immigrant status. That's a great program as well, but what it basically tells me about the job market in this country and about the attitudes of our employers is that they value Canadian experience to, I think, a degree that they overlook the fact that somebody with international experience may actually count as much or more than the Canadian experience. It's totally the opposite when you go to Asia, by the way. I was in China a few years ago at a kind of a talent type event, you know, where they brought the best and the brightest from all over the Chinese diaspora to talk about opportunities. And the discussion in that meeting was entirely about how do we help Chinese people get international experience so that they can help China? We don't seem to have that attitude here. And unless that changes, I am worried that we'll send 10,000 students abroad they'll come back and they'll find that the employers don't value what they did and they'll be disillusioned and it will be set back even further. Uh, one of the information I want to share with you is that uh, we have been, in my school, we have been trying to send our students overseas uh, for six months to a year at least uh, during their study in my school. Now at the graduate's uh, master's students level, about 80%, I think, of our students have a chance to go, to, go overseas. And my, my, my hope is that we can do the same with our undergrad students. Uh, but of course, we have a problem of uh, financial support. Uh, but over time, I, this is uh, the goal we are striving for. We believe that a student uh, can benefit uh, a lot, and our country can benefit a lot if they have overseas experience. Uh, they have broader vision, uh, and this would prepare them for being a more useful person in society. Okay, one, one positive, uh, one negative. A positive, I've seen a sharp uptake in the number of Chinese students, graduate students, wanting to come to this country because we have a very generous program whereby if you complete a, gra a graduate program in Canada, you're on a fast track to permanent resident status, and that is a huge draw. I've had students say, which is the easiest graduate program to get into? Not even something they would normally think of studying, but they want to come here to study, and then, then they'll do what they want. The negative, and it's, it's unfortunate, it's structural to our country, um, promoting education abroad is fiendishly complicated, it's a provincial responsibility, it's very hard to project a Canadian brand when you've got 13 um, uh, fiefdoms, each warring over who has responsibility for it, and a reluctance to buy into a national strategy. It's not an excuse to do nothing, it's just one of those one hand tied behind our back problems that we Gordon, have. Gordon, that is the national brand. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Touche. Uh, with that, we're right on time, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our panel uh, for what was, I think, a very vigorous and very uh, uh, entertaining conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.